Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week I thought we would close the books on the Inspiration4 mission. If you don't know what this is, this was that group of private astronauts that went into space for three days. They launched last week. They went into orbit and stayed there for three days and then came back down Saturday night. And I thought we would talk about what it is they did up there and see what might be coming next for the commercial space business. Let's get to it. Now, in case you missed it, we did cover the splashdown of Inspiration4 on Saturday night. This is how these Dragon capsules come back to Earth. And if you think about what the crew went through, they were weightless for three days. You then get some pretty good G-forces on the way down because you're going from 17,500 miles per hour to about 15 miles per hour under the parachutes. You hit the water at 15 miles per hour, which is kind of like a low-speed car crash and then you're bobbing in the ocean while experiencing gravity again. I can't imagine what that must feel like for people that might get motion sickness. Now, one of the cool things that we did on the live stream was raise money for St. Jude, and that is the organization that this mission hoped to raise $200 million for, and you all helped with that. We brought in just under $300 during that live stream, and I've got the link active for this fundraiser on the right-hand side of your screen if you're watching on desktop. I think there's also a link on mobile to make a contribution as well. And this goes through the YouTube giving feature. And so any money you give doesn't go to me. It goes right to St. Jude uh, through this YouTube fundraising apparatus, which is really cool. And as you can see, they've raised about $600,000 or so from all of the different channels that have been participating uh, in this fundraiser. Now, Inspiration4 launched on September 15th. That was last Wednesday from the time I'm shooting this video. It took them about 12 or 13 minutes to get into orbit. And you can see here an interior shot from the Dragon spacecraft right after they got into their initial orbit. What they did after they stabilized things was lift the Dragon up higher. So initially they were kind of under the orbit of what the International Space Station would typically be at, and then they raised the orbit to an altitude higher than the Hubble Space Telescope. And the last time humans were orbiting at that height was one of the last Hubble servicing missions on the space shuttle. It takes a lot to get up there, and they wanted to kind of push the boundaries a little bit beyond where humans have typically been exploring space. And they stayed up at that orbit for most of the mission. And I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of pictures they took while they were up there. So what did they do up there? Well, unfortunately, we didn't get much from the crew while they were on orbit. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But one of the big focuses of the mission was doing some research for the Baylor College of Medicine's Center for Space Medicine. And what this group is looking at is researching around commercial space flight and how commercial astronauts might react to going into space versus professional astronauts. Remember, this crew was assembled back in March of 2021, just a few months ago, and they've had a whirlwind of training, but not as much training as a NASA astronaut might receive before they go into orbit. And a bulk of what they had to focus on, given this compressed time schedule, was learning all of the SpaceX Dragon systems should something go wrong on orbit. And so NASA astronauts, of course, do that same training, but then get a bunch of other training for preparing their bodies and minds for all the things that might be happening to them when they are suddenly weightless. And this crew did not get that. So part of what they were looking for was how a commercial crew with less training compares to a professional crew that gets more. And these are some of the studies that they were looking at related to body fluids. They were doing blood and saliva analysis. They had a mini ultrasound up there to look at fluids inside the body. They were also looking at how they readapted to gravity after they came back. So I would imagine that's something they're going through right now. And this issue of space sickness is nothing new to NASA. Uh, this article is back from 1983 or so when they were flying civilians on space shuttle missions. And it talks about uh, former Senator Jake Garn, who was from Utah. Uh, NASA did launch two members of Congress on two separate missions back in the 80s before Challenger. And Senator Garn, who was a seasoned Navy pilot with 10,000 hours of flight time, was in great shape, 
Uh, he was so sick on that flight, they unofficially named a space sickness scale after him. And there's some other funny stories in this book called Riding Rockets from astronaut Mike Mullane, which I really enjoyed and kind of told the inside story of what it was like to go into space. There's a lot of really cool stuff that happens, but there's also a lot of pretty gross stuff that happens too. Uh, so definitely check out that article uh, and Mullane's book here if you want to learn more about some of the things you don't always hear about related to spaceflight. Now, in addition to doing the research, they also had to collect footage for the final episode of the Countdown documentary series on Netflix. And they are hopefully going to come down with some really cool 4K footage from that trip. But unfortunately, that footage, at the moment at least, is only going to be available to Netflix subscribers and not to the general public. However, they did take a lot of smartphone and other camera video that they'll be releasing over the next couple of days. And in addition to the research and the Netflix tasks, they also did a couple of calls with the ground, one to St. Jude's patients and another to the general public on the SpaceX YouTube channel. They did do a quick live stream there. And it looks like they also talked to Tom Cruise, who is planning to take his own SpaceX trip up in the coming months to shoot a movie up there. So it's definitely going to be a little crazy here with all these commercial space flights coming up. So I do think that the Inspiration4 mission was very successful and I think handled the way a first space mission for commercial human space flight should be handled in that this wasn't just a bucket full of billionaires going on a joyride. It was a billionaire who basically gave away the other three seats and took himself out of the process of choosing who his crewmates were. And I think the three people that went along with him are an excellent representation of us humans here on Earth. They're people of high integrity and character, and I really enjoyed getting to know who they were uh, from their social media stuff earlier, but also from the Netflix documentary. But I will say the communication from their PR team here was not good during the mission. And I know people hate criticism these days, but I do think criticism is an important part of any big public event. And in criticizing the mission, just to put this out there, I am not hating on the mission. You can be critical of things, yet still support the overall cause and mission, which is exactly the place that I am in. I've been on a school board here in my local town for the last 18 years, and I get a lot of criticism, and I don't take it personally. What I take it as are people who love the community and the school and want us to do better on behalf of them and their kids. And that is the same spirit in which I am offering this criticism today. So let's get into it. Now, as I mentioned, the crew got into orbit at around 8.15 p.m. or so, give or take, on September 15th. Shortly after achieving that orbit, SpaceX shut down the live stream that they were doing for the mission. And that is not unusual. Typically, when SpaceX has one of their live streams, they finish it after whatever it is they're launching gets into a stable orbit. And we did not hear a thing from the Inspiration4 people from 8.15 p.m. straight through into the next day. In fact, the only time we heard about the crew's well-being was the following afternoon at 2 p.m. from SpaceX, who said the crew was doing fine. And that was followed up at around 3.51 p.m. from Elon Musk saying he spoke with the crew personally and everything was going well. And these tweets came out because there was a lot of buzz out there from people who were following the mission who were concerned that we haven't heard from the crew since we saw the end of the live stream. There was nothing else communicated until the following afternoon. And again, we still hadn't heard at this point from the Inspiration4 PR team through their Twitter account. They were still silent. And the only sign of crew activity we got came about an hour later when they retweeted this tweet from MGM Casinos saying that Jared Isaacman, who's the commander of the mission, who paid for the mission, made a bet on the Super Bowl, and that came out at around 5 p.m. And so we hadn't heard a thing, and then all of a sudden we're getting something about him placing a Super Bowl bet, which was kind of bizarre. At 7.25 p.m., St. Jude tweeted to say that uh, they did actually conduct a video chat with patients at the hospital. And this was not broadcast out, likely because there are uh, HIPAA issues, which is the medical privacy law here in the U.S. So they probably needed to get clearance from all the different parents involved before they put that video out. They did eventually do that. 
but they could have maybe grabbed a still frame from it or something and put it out there because guess what? A few people on Twitter did and they posted not any pictures of the kids, but a picture of one of the crew members looking out the big cupola window that they had installed on the Dragon spacecraft. And every one of those pictures got taken down shortly after they got posted. I don't know if it was a DMCA request or if the team reached out directly to those people. So however it happened, an unofficial image leaked out and it got taken down. And throughout the entire time of this radio silence from the Inspiration4 team, there was concerns that were starting to percolate from people on social media. And I think one of the flaws of this PR team is that they only saw communication through the traditional way, which is going out to the big outlets like the networks and everybody else and not thinking about the fact that there's a lot of people who follow this mission on social media that drive a lot of the narrative. And the continued silence, the effort apparently to take images down, just drove a lot of concern and frustration that we were not getting the amount of content or at least the amount of updates that all of the pre-launch communication set an expectation for. And this translated into bad press for them. This Gizmodo article kind of summed up some of the frustrations that this reporter had, but I think also what a lot of people on social media were feeling as well. Now, all that said, we, the public, were not entitled to anything from this mission because it was private after all. However, again, I do think they set an expectation with all the lead up to the launch that we would be seeing something from the crew while they were on orbit. And I wasn't expecting a 24 seven live stream like some people were, but a photo every once in a while probably would have been helpful to let us know that things were okay and they were acclimating well to space. Now, one of the other rumors that started percolating because it went unanswered by the PR team was the fact that maybe Netflix had put a lockdown on any media coming down from the orbital flight until their September 30th finale to the documentary series came out. That turned out to be not the case, but that was what people were talking about because there was no counteracting narrative from the PR team. Now, finally, at the uh, end of the first full day on orbit, they did post some photos of the crew. So they did start upping things a bit. In fact, one of the members of the press that they were talking to uh, said that it looked like from uh, his post here at noon on the 17th that a lot more would be coming down from orbit. Now, what's interesting in this tweet here is he said, understandably, it took some time to get acclimated to space for the crew, essentially. And that kind of leads me to think that they were all experiencing some space sickness that probably slowed them down for the first chunk of the mission. And how does he know this? Well, it's likely because this PR team was not focused on modern public communications that they were talking to members of the media on background. And this is why we didn't see anything in the media about the status of the mission and why the PR team was silent because they were calling up all these reporters that they're talking to saying, hey, on background, they're a little sick, they need a few more hours, and then you'll start seeing some more stuff from them. And because it was on background, nothing got published. So all of us out here in the public heard nothing and were concerned. And I think if they had just put a tweet out to say, hey, the crew's taking some time to get adjusted, we'll be back in a few hours, I think people would have accepted that. Meanwhile, the PR team says nothing and they rely upon members of the media to get the message out for them. But not everybody follows Eric Berger, right? If they had just put it on their own Twitter account, I think things would have gone a little smoothly or more smoothly uh, for them as the mission continued. But they did get a lot out on the 17th. Uh, they did do their live stream, which you can see here and it got better, which was great. But there was a very long stretch of a very short mission where I think they could have done a lot better. Now, one thing Jared Isaacman said this morning on Twitter was that one of the problems in getting more photos and video down from the Dragon was that they were using NASA satellites that they were paying to lease time on. And NASA and the other government agencies had priority on those satellites. And of course, those are the same satellites that communicate with the space station. So he did say more will be getting pushed out uh, via social channels today, which I'm sure you'll see. But this is an example of something that the PR team could have tweeted out in the heat of the moment to say, hey, there's actually a reason why we don't have photos coming up. We're having trouble getting satellite time. Again, that would have settled down, I think, a lot of the noise out there.
And I think they really failed by focusing only on big outlets and not directly communicating. And just to show you the strength of independent outlets, take a look at the viewership that two of my favorite space channels got on the night of the launch. Between the two of them, NASA Spaceflight and the Everyday Astronaut accumulated over a million views of this event compared to the only 414,000 views that Netflix got for their live stream. And this is after people spent money promoting what they were doing and actually hiring two experienced anchors to cover the event. Clearly, when it comes to the space stuff, independent media has a seat at the table. And I think they missed some opportunities here by not communicating directly to the public, but also through some of these independent outlets. So where do we go from here? Well, there's still more money to raise for St. Jude, and I think there is still more of a story to tell about this mission. So I've got some suggestions for the team rolling forward here. The first is that I would love for them to release the photos and videos that they shot on orbit into the Creative Commons, and that will help independent creators use the footage without fear of getting a copyright takedown from Netflix, for example. And I think some of the footage that was shot with those 4K Netflix cameras should be made available to us as well, because I think that really will help to continue to amplify the story and get it out to more people so they can keep contributing uh, to St. Jude. I would hate for this to end at the end of the mission because I think there's still more to tell about this story. And just to give you a comparative here, everything that NASA does by law is completely available in the public domain. And they've actually got a website to help you find stuff at images.nasa.gov. But anything else that you might stumble across on YouTube that came from a NASA camera is free to use, like something like this photo here of astronauts docking with the International Space Station. This is a cool video, isn't it? It's like real raw and real, and they're just sitting on the flight deck of the space shuttle, closing in on the space station, and you can see uh, the astronauts controlling things here and the space station docking mechanism closing in on the shuttle's mechanism there. Just cool stuff. And that's the sort of thing that I would love to see from this mission so that we can get a better picture as to what the crew did and help tell their story. And I'd also like for them to reach out to independent creators, maybe some interviews with the crew members to talk about their experiences and that sort of thing. Again, they've been largely focused on the big networks, and I don't think there have been many interviews with some of these independent outlets out there with the crew members. And I know a lot of them would like to have that opportunity and involve their viewers in the discussion as well. Now, if you want to follow the mission and see what they are releasing, uh, you can follow all of these Twitter accounts here including Jared Isaacman, who's on the top there. Haley Arsenault was the physician's assistant from St. Jude, who was the first person picked for the mission. Dr. Sion Proctor, one of my favorites from the mission, was the one who won the prosperity seat. She's been uh, doing some really cool stuff leading up to the launch, and I really enjoyed hearing her story on the documentary. Chris Zembrowski is the one that won that raffle contest. And actually, as it turns out, he didn't actually win it, but a friend of his did and his friend gave him the seat. And this was allowed by the rules. There's nothing you know, fishy going on here, but he has a friend that basically gave him a $55 million ride to orbit. So I'd love to have a friend like that. Uh, you can also follow Inspiration4's official Twitter account at Inspiration4x. They're thankfully tweeting a lot more now. And then of course, St. Jude uh, has also been uh, pumping out some content there. Now what's next for commercial space flight? Well, the first uh, bucket of billionaires is going up. Uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, Axiom is sending up three billionaires and a retired astronaut to the space station. And that's one of the things that you can do now is actually pay to go to the space station and visit it. The Russians are sending up a film crew and an actress, I think in the next couple of weeks, to do some shooting of a Russian movie up on the space station. So that station's going to get a lot busier with a lot of visitors coming by. And you too can go if you've got uh, three friends who can cough up $55 million each plus your $55 million ticket uh, to head up onto the space station. So commercial space is here. I don't think we'll be seeing as much altruism as we saw with this last mission. And I also think we're going to not hear a lot from many of these private missions because, again, they are private. 
but the NASA missions that will be heading to the moon in the very near future will be quite public and we'll still have plenty to talk about. Now, during our live stream last night, we did have some people contribute to St. Jude, as I mentioned, and there's still opportunities to do that on the link at the side of the screen. But I want to thank Eric's Variety Channel, who made a gold level contribution to St. Jude, along with Ian Powell, who made his donation from the UK. And there was a few other anonymous donors who did not leave their name. And if you were one of them, uh, send me an email at lon at lon.tv and I'll give you a shout out next week. I don't know if the YouTube thing is going to report who contributes from this video. So if you do make a contribution and you want a shout out, uh, let me know via email and I will include you uh, in the shout outs next week. And Eric's Variety Channel also made a super chat contribution on a prior live stream uh, that I did last week. So thank you, Eric, for all of your support. And we have a new supporter this week, actually a current supporter who made his own gold level contribution to the channel, and that is Amda Brown. And I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel through my donor box page. We also support Patreon, the YouTube membership program through that join button down at the bottom and Floatplane. We've got a lot of other channels you can check out, including my Amazon shop, where you can find a lot of my content ad-free. And we have some ways to engage with the channel. One of those is my email list, which I totally forgot to use to tell you about our live stream for the landing or the splashdown of the Dragon Capsule. So it's very infrequent on that email list, but definitely sign up for when we've got big news here on the channel. We also just added a Discord, which is starting to grow a bit, and I'm trying to think of some ways that we might be able to integrate the Discord into my live stream, so stay tuned for that. And then we've got my store that you can find at lon.tv store, where I sell previously used items that I bought to review here on the channel. And there's only one of everything because it's the actual item we reviewed, and you can get notified whenever we add something to the store by going to lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for listening to my thoughts about the Inspiration4 mission. I think it was a tremendous success for St. Jude, but also for commercial spaceflight and humanity in general. I think it was really done the right way, and there's always ways that things can get improved for the things that we do support and love. And that's what I wanted to get across today in my criticism of their PR team. That is gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.